Mike, can you hear us and see us okay from Kingsport? You look good, sound good, bud. All right, thank you.
Hello, Debbie. Hi, Rob. That How worked, are you? Whatever you needed to switch. Yeah. All right. So the first thing is you have uh, homework for me, correct? Make sure you get your name on it. We'll get those. So the where we left off last um, Thursday is I, I want to remind you a couple things is we were looking at this correlation. I never did show you how we were going to calculate or anything yet, but I, I want to go back to like right where I was left off. Remember, for us that correlation is always denoted. by a, a lowercase r. So when you see that lowercase r, we're talking about this correlation. And so the thing about the correlation is it measures two things about a linear relationship. It measures the strength and it measures the direction. And that's kind of where I want to go back to because I had written these facts. And I told you that the facts are just as important as any kind of calculation because in a few minutes here, I'm going to show you how to get the software to calculate it for us. So we're never going to calculate anything by hand with the correlation, all right? So the facts are just as important as the number we're going to get out. I want to go back to number three. And this is the part about the direction. So if R is positive number, in other words, you know, we get this number spit out to us as positive, that means we're seeing a positive association. What that means is, is when we look at our scatter plot, we see the points go from lower left to upper right, right? And then if the correlation is negative, that means we have a negative association. So that means when I look at the scatter plot, I should be from upper left to lower right of the scatter plot, right? So this, the way I think about this is, this part right here, if it's going to tell me two things, and it's going to tell me the direction and the strength, this part here is telling me about the direction, right? The sign of it. Forget what the value is. If it's positive, you're seeing a positive association. If it's negative, you're seeing a negative association. And then the one where I left off on last week was this one. Yet this is always true. So this part here is going to tell us about the strength. In other words, how close do the points follow this linear form? Remember, because all this is dealing with a linear form and only a linear form. And my thought is this, is the closer to plus one or minus one, the stronger the linear relationship. Or the linear association. Okay? Now, If for some crazy reason we could get R to be plus or minus 1, remember the science is telling you which way the points are laying, right? What kind of association, what kind of direction you're seeing. If we could get R equals plus or minus 1, this would be what we would call perfect linear. What that means is, if I had my scatter plot on a piece of paper with my dots on it, my individuals, I could put a ruler down and draw a line that went through all the points. Perfect. They lie exactly on a line. All right, let's be honest. We're looking at real-world data. That ain't never really going to happen. But if it could, we would be exactly on that line. Now, before we calculate anything, I think about it like this. All right, so, you know, I pulled out this little chunk of the number line from minus 1 to 1. 
and kind of throw some words at you here. Obviously, it's an extreme. Minus one and one is perfect. Here I would tell you that you're some version of very strong, right? So I'd like to say, you know, we're very strong out here. In other words, between point nine and one, oh, things are looking really good. You're, things are looking very linear here. We've done the right thing. Same thing down here, right? I mean, that just means you're looking at a you know, a negative association between minus 1 and minus 0.9, I would be talking still about very strong. Okay, between, let's say, 0 0.7 and 0 0.9, I'd be talking about Oh yeah, moderately strong. Now I'm being wishy-washy. Same thing over here. Here I would say you're this shit, oh I got the word moderate, right? In between 0.5 and 0.7. Is there a linear relationship? Yeah, is it really strong? No. But do I see one? Yeah. Same thing over here. And then between let's say minus 0.5, and right, here, let me put another one in here. Here I'd be talking about you know, when I start getting between 0.5, I mean, I might say something like moderately weak or something like that, right? And then between here and here, I got some, I got some issues, right? Because remember, we're getting close to zero there as I go to the middle, that little minus one to one. I, would, I don't have like a word I want to put there, but what I want you to understand is this. Is the closer you get to zero from either side, the weaker it is. And at some point when you're starting to get close to zero, let's say maybe between minus 0.2 and 0.2, right? Folks, we're not seeing a linear relationship. That's the key. And to be honest with you, if you see something like, and I'm going to put it like this, maybe, I know it's yellow, so that's minus 0 0.1 to 0 0.1. I'd say, you're not linear. Folks, you were thinking you were looking at a linear relationship. The correlation came back and it was between minus 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. It's not linear. You wasted your time. You weren't looking at a line. You weren't looking at a linear relationship. It's something else. We okay with that? So I wanted to get you, the way I think it is, you don't really have one. You know, we're weak, we're weak, we're moderately, moderately strong, we're very strong, we're perfect. My hand's moving out the, that piece of the number line. All right? Now, what I would like to do is, I would like to look at the two scatter plots we looked at last week. Remember we had the one about percent taking and uh, the SAT state math score out of chapter 3. I'd like to find that file and oh, I quit talking because you guys are familiar with my moves here. It's the same way I always get to so I'm in chapter 4 and I'm interested in this math SAT. We made a scatter plot for it. Remember, we thought maybe the percent taking the exam out of each state in the District of Columbia would help explain or influence uh, the state's mean math score, SAT math score. And so, if I wanted to graph, remember we came to scatter plot, just a simple one, and then I want to do percent, uh, excuse me, the math score and then the percent taking. Everybody okay with this? This is the same one I showed you last week. And then we looked at this and we decided, 
Yeah, we see a negative association going from upper left to lower right. And yeah, it was, I saw something that was linear with a slight curve, and then I circled the two chunks of everything, right? That was the one we looked at. So if I calculate the correlation here, what are you expecting out of the correlation? Are you expecting it to be negative or positive? I'm expecting it to be negative because I see a negative association. Are you expecting it to be close to, let's say, minus 0.3 or closer to, let's say, minus 0.8 or something? Well, let's see. If I go to STAT, basic statistics, we've been there before because that's where you get your mean standard deviation by number summary. And if you come all the way almost to the bottom here, there's something called the correlation, right? That's our correlation that we're talking about. Same formula, same calculation, everything. If I click OK, it says the variables. Now, notice, all it cares is that you have two quantitative variables. It does not care that you have one called the explanatory and the other one character called the response, right? It makes no distinction between explanatory and response. The one's on the X and one's on the Y. All I got to do is double click both of them to get them in there. And then you see where it says display key value. I always uncheck that because it means you don't have anything to do with that. All I want is the number. I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to make that a little smaller, pull it over. And here it says my Pearson correlation, that's RR, is minus 0.893. Why did I leave the scatter plot up with that? Does the minus make sense to everybody? Negative correlation, negative association. How strong is it? Well, it's pretty strong, right? It's in that moderately strong area. Yep. So what we're seeing is, we're seeing a moderately strong negative linear relationship, linear association between percent taking and the state's mean math that's increased. Everybody okay with that? The closer those points fit the line, the stronger the correlation is. I'm going to leave that one up. Let's do the, did we do the one about the manatees? Right, the manatees? So I would like to make a scatter plot of that, just to remind you, just a simple one. And this time, remember, we thought that the number of boats registered helped explain the number of manatees killed in any given year. So the kills is your response, your Y. The number of boats registered is your X or your explanatory variable. And I click OK. So let me ask you this. Are you expecting your correlation to be positive or negative? We're expecting this to be positive because we see a positive association, right? Do you think it's stronger than the last one? In other words, the other one was going to be negative, it was negative 8.93. This one's going to be positive. Do you expect it to be closer to 1 than the other one was to minus 1? I don't know. We're going to go to stat, basic statistics, correlation. Put in the boats, the kills. Remember, it doesn't matter the order. It makes no distinction. It just wants two quantitative variables. Does that make sense? First off, does the sign make sense? I see a positive association in the scatter plot. The correlation is coming back positive. So let me ask you this. Here's two of these. One of these has a correlation of negative 0.893. The other one's got a correlation of 0.953. Which one's stronger? The one that's 0.953, right? Remember, the signs just tell me what association is in what direction is in. Okay? So the correlation tells me two things, strength and direction. The one on the top is actually stronger because the correlation is closer to 1. The one on the bottom is negative. It's a negative, what was it, 0.893 or something like that. It's still strong, right? That's the deal here. Now, I can sit here and draw you all kinds of pictures. I thought it would be better to work with something that we really had, right, to make sure that you understand what the sign is telling me. Because, look, the book shows you on page 114, there's this example 4.6, and there's six different scatter plots there. It's not real data, but there's six different scatter plots. I figured I could get everything across to you in two. The, the better you can see the line, 
the stronger the correlation, the stronger the relationship, right? All the sign tells me this is negative or positive association, and then I'm looking, are you getting close to minus one, or are you getting close to plus one? The closer you are, the stronger it is, okay? Now, with that said, back here, all of that, there's a, I'm going to call them cautions, <coughs> warnings about calculating the and using the correlation. So these are cautions about the correlation. One, both variables are quantitative. I had said that out loud last week. I don't know if I wrote it, but I had said it out loud. You cannot calculate the correlation between, let's say, a quantitative variable and a categorical variable. There's no way to calculate the correlation between somebody's gender and their yearly income. I got a whole problem getting that M or F in there, right? Both the variables need to be quantitative. Two, only linear. It will not tell you about any other form. It's only checking for linear, strength and direction of that. Three, strongly influenced by outliers. Now, here's my thought. I'm going to write the formula down for you one more time that I wrote down last Thursday. Not that I'm ever going to use it on you, but I want to write it down again. Remember, the correlation is its some kind of average, right? Where you added all these little pieces together. Where we standardized the x value and we standardized the y value. The reason I'm writing the formula down for you again is because look what's in the formula. The mean of the x's and the mean of the y's. What do we know about the mean of some variable? Is it strongly influenced by outliers? Yeah. So anytime you use something that's strongly influenced by outliers to calculate something else, the something else is going to be strongly influenced by outliers also. And the standard deviation is exactly the same way. It's strongly influenced by outliers. So shit, you've got like four things that are strongly influenced by outliers in the calculation, and I'm going to give you then, obviously, the correlation is going to be strongly influenced by outliers. Now, normally when I say that kind of statement to you, right, that something's strongly influenced by outliers, I always tell you how, right? Remember the means pulled towards the outliers, right? The standard deviation is made bigger than it should be. I'm going to save on how until the next chapter. Because an outlier here can actually make the correlation worse. In other words, closer to zero. Or it can make it better. Closer to one or closer to minus one, depending on how it's an outlier and where it's an outlier on the scatter plot. So I'm going to say that for the end of the next chapter. I will come back and remind you, yeah, yeah, remember the correlation is strongly influenced by outliers. And I'm going to show you when I put the outlier here or here, Oh, shit, I can make this better or worse. In other words, I can make it closer to 1 or minus 1, or I can make it closer to 0. Okay? And then 4. R is not a complete summary of a relationship between two quantitative variables. All right, you got two quantitative variables. Just calculate the R and be done with it. No, nah, there's more to it than this. You always want to give the scatter plot. You want to give everybody a picture. Right? You would like to give the mean of your x variable, the standard deviation of your x, the mean of the y, the 
standard deviation of the y, and also the correlation. Now we're looking at a complete picture of your relationship between two quantitative variables. Scatter plot your graph, give me the mean and standard deviations of both the x and y variable, and then give me the correlation. And then there's a number five here that's kind of worth adding here. Adding or subtracting the same number to either x or y or both does not change R. In other words, you've got an X variable where you've got a Y variable. If you add the same number to all the X's, you're not going to change the correlation. If you add the same number to all the Y's, you're not going to change the correlation. If you add the same number to all the X's and all the Y's, you're not going to change it. What am I doing on the scatter plot when I, just for example, let's say my scatter plot looks like this. No, no, I always draw linear ones, remember? Right? So I expect the correlation to be positive here, and I expect it to be close to 1. So what, what does it mean to add the same number to all the x values of all these points here? It means you're going to add whatever, you're going to pick the graph up, and you're going to move all the points the same distance this way. I try to make my arrows all the same length. Right? This is where you're adding to x. Did I change the picture? Well, no, I just picked the shit up and moved it all over by 10 or 15 or whatever it is, right? The correlation is not going to change you. So if I take the same number and add it to all the uh, x's, right? So add to x. You're just picking up and moving. Or if you're subtracting, you're doing this. What about if you add the same number to all the y's? Instead of moving it this way or this way, you're going to pick it up and move it this way. What about if you add to the y x's and then to the y's? You're going to go here and here. Is it the same look at scatter plot? And the answer is, yeah, it's just relocated on the scatter plot, right? So my point is, if you start adding or subtracting the same values to your x's or y's or both, you're not going to change the correlation at all. You're just relocating the, the little points on your scatter plot. That's all you're doing here. Okay? Now, I would like to do one more problem here. And I would like to take a look at problem 414 on page 117 so that I can hopefully get this little thought in your head. It says, strong association but no correlation. The gas mileage of an automobile first increases and then decreases as speed increases. Suppose this relationship is very regular as shown by the following data on speed and miles per hour and uh, mileage, miles per gallon. So they give me a little table. They've got speed and mileage. The speed goes from 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and they've got mileage 24, 28, 30, 28, 24, right? And then it says... Make a scatter plot of mileage versus speed. Did we have that talk about it's always y on at versus x or y on x? So I would like to make a scatter plot of this data. I would like to make a scatter plot of this problem here, 414. And I actually want to show you a couple things about it. Right? So look, that's just a table that's in the book, and I want mileage versus speed, so I'm going to take speed as my explanatory variable and mileage as my response. So my response is miles per gallon, speed is my x. Anybody see a linear form here? Does anybody see a negative or positive association? No, what I see here is
In other words, you know, there's some optimal speed here where you get the best miles per gallon. On either side of that, the miles per gallon goes down, right? So that's perfect. That's almost perfectly curved, right? I can almost draw my curve perfect if my hands didn't shake, right? Yeah, so here's one that's got a really nice form. Hell, I can pick that form out every day of the week that it looks like a really nice curved form. I would like to calculate the correlation for you. Okay, so we're going to slide this guy over here. Remember, stat, basic statistics, correlation. Put both of them in there. Anybody shocked? How can I have such a good form, and all of a sudden the correlation is zero? This goes back to my caution that says it only checks linear. The form is almost perfectly curved, but the correlation is coming back zero. Not shock, because the correlation tells me only about linear. That's the reason I wanted to do this problem. Here's one. Well, shit, the form's really good. Correlation zero. How can that be? I don't know. I think they're all there. Right? So I guess my thought is this with this problem also. When somebody tells you that the correlation is close to zero, here it's exactly zero. Does that mean we don't have a pattern? No. What it means is you don't have a linear form. Could we have another type of form? You understand why I got this up here? You guys are all looking at your computer. You understand why I got this up here? Here's one where the correlation is exactly zero, but I have a perfect curved form. So just because the correlation is close to zero does not mean that you don't have some other form. It means you don't have a linear form. See, because I got this little problem I always put on the first test about this. It turns out there's a relationship between the temperature that you bake a brownie at and the quality or the, how good the brownie is. Yes? You understand, if you cook it at, so I'm thinking about the temperature helps explain the quality. So, you know, at low temperatures, when you get the brownies out, they're all gooey and not done, and so that would be poor quality, right? If you took them at, cook them at too high of a temperature, what happens to your brownies? They're, they're, like, they're like a freaking rock, right? They ain't no good quality. In fact, there's some sweet spot in here, right? When you cook them at the right temperature, you get these really nice brownies. In other words, you see the picture I have here? I could change this and put the temperature you bake them at is your X, and the quality of them your Y, and I'd see the exact same picture. And suppose I tell you, you know, the correlation between the temperature you bake your brownies at and the quality of them is like, I don't know, I don't want to say it's exactly zero because I already did that. Suppose I tell you it's like R is 0.05. Is that close to zero, 0.05? What does that mean? What that means is, is you don't have a linear relationship, but you might have a relationship of another form. What do we need to have? We need to look at the scatter plot, because that's all me and you have. It doesn't mean you don't have a relationship. It means you don't have a linear one. We should check the scatter plot to see if it's curved. You okay with that? All right. Then I'll shut up about the brown. Okay, so this is the one where R is zero, right? We calculated it. Not linear, but curved. I don't know how else to get this across to you that that's all the correlation is ever checking, the strength and direction of the engine. Okay? There used to be another problem here I like. I'd like to get to the next chapter because I warned you last week, four and five, that's just all really one big chapter. So I'd like to move on to five because there's a next step here. You know, we look at a scatter plot, we calculate the correlation. The, the next step is this chapter five. And it's something called regression.
Okay? Now, I'm going to be very specific about what we're looking at here. Again, all I'm looking at is a linear relationship between two quantitative variables. And I'm going to circle this. So it makes sense to talk about R, because we're always looking to see if we're linear. And that's all we're looking at here. What we want to do is this. We want to summarize the overall pattern linear. Right? The overall pattern is linear. That is your form here. By very simply drawing a line on the scatter plot. That's what this chapter is about. This chapter right here is about that line you want to put on that scatter plot. Okay? Now, here's my thought with these regression lines. This line we're going to put on here, this line I want to draw on here is called a regression line. So, can I come back here for a second? I did this to you last week. I'd like to go back to these manatees. That was like the best linear form we had. And you remember when I made the scatter plot? One time last week, I actually went over here with regression. I wanted to put that regression line on, and I wanted to fit that line to the data. So if I try to fit that line to the data, remember the number of kills was your response, your Y, the number of votes is your uh, X, your response. So you see that line there, it's in red? That's your regression line that summarizes this overall, pa overall pattern, this linear form we see between the number of boats registered and the number of manatees killed. That's the deal here, all right? Now, with that said, I'm not going to get rid of that yet. If I come back here, and when I think about this, or these regression lines, this idea of putting these, drawing these lines on the scatter plot, okay? My thought is this, okay? Anytime we do this, we're going to have this explanatory response distinction. In other words, we're going to call one of the variables explanatory, put it on the x, the other variable our response, and put it on our y. Because one of two things is true. Either we think one explains or influences the other, or we want to use one to predict the other. And that's what I told you last Thursday. Either one of those two cases, we want to make sure we call one explanatory and the other response. Do we think one explains or influences the other, or do you want to use one to predict the other? Okay, so that's the set. Now, I'm on page 127 here. And it says, a regression line is a straight line. Does anybody know any lines that aren't straight? No, no, I always like to make fun of the book. You got to put in there a straight line, and you just told me it was a line. That meant straight to me, right? That describes how a response variable y changes as an explanatory variable x changes. Remember, the x is down here, the y is here, right? A regression line helps explain how the response variable changes as you start changing the explanatory variable. It says we often use a line to predict the value of y for a given value of x. Uh, folks, that's the part I'm going to write down. Predict the value of y for a given value of x. Okay? That's the reason me and you want 
one of these regression lines. This is the reason me and you want to summarize this linear form by drawing a line on there, because what we want to be able to do is we want somebody to give us a value of x, and I want to use the line to predict you a value of y. Right? That's the that's what we want here. That's the whole purpose of this for us. Now, I want to come over here and I want to look at this example 5.1. Eventually, I'm going to go to the homework and pull out a couple problems, but I wanted to start with this one. And it says, example 5.1, why is it that some people think uh, find it easy to stay slim? Here, following the four-step process is an account of a study that sheds some light on gaining weight. I don't care about any four-step process. We're going to go through and work through this. I'm expecting two quantitative variables here, and it says this. Some people don't gain weight even when they overeat. Anybody know anybody like that? Yeah. Perhaps fidgeting and other non-exercise activity, we're going to call that NEA, explains why. In fact, some people may spontaneously increase their non-exercise activity when fed more. Right? They just start all of a sudden start fidgeting and moving around more when you overfeed them. Folks, in case you don't know, I'm not one of those people. You overfeed my you overfeed me, and I just run like a cow face, right? My non-exercise activity went down. There's, there's people out there, you overfeed them and all of a sudden they're like, Right, they're visiting perfect calories. Yes? Okay. It says, um, when fed, thus reducing the amount of weight gained from overeating. To investigate the effect of NEA on fat gain, researchers deliberately overfed 16 healthy young adults for eight weeks. I want to go all the way back to chapter one. So, who are my individuals here? I'm looking at 16 healthy. Those are your individuals. And what did you do? You overfed them for eight weeks. They measured two things on these 16 healthy young adults. One of them is they measured fat gain. And they measured the fat gain in terms of the number of kilograms they gained in fat. And then, as an explanatory variable, they the variable change in exercise, energy use, and calories from activity other than deliberate exercise. So I'm going to say NEA, you know, that non-exercise activity, and they measure that in calories. You know, how many more calories or fewer calories did you burn? Now, I wrote them in kind of a weird order because the way we're going to think about this is we think that maybe the non-exercise activity helps explain or influences their fat gain, so, this is going to be your explanatory variable. And this is going to be your response. So, fat, excuse me, NEA change, you know, NEA change is going to be on the explanatory, and your fat gain is going to be on the response here. It says, um, Change in energy use was energy used uh, measured the last day of the eight-week period minus energy used the day before the overeating. So here's the thing. I've got a table here, and I'm going to pull up the file here because I'm not going to just look at their uh, scatter plot. I'm going to get rid of this one. I'm going to find this file here for uh, chapter five, fat gain, because I want to take a look at this. File here a second. Now you notice there's 16 individuals, right? That's the very left hand column. For each one of them, you have their NEA change, and then you have their fat gain, right? After you overfed them for eight weeks. So there's three of these that catch my eye. You see the first person here, I don't know, male or female. The first, second, and third one, you see their NEA change is negative. What does that mean? What did they do when you overfed them? They didn't fidget more, they didn't move around more, they became couch potatoes, and they actually burnt less calories after you overfed them. More like normal humans like me. You see, all the ones after that are positive, what happened to them? Oh, when you overfed them, they started fidgeting, moving around, they burnt more calories after you overfed them, right? Okay? So, here's what I would like to do. I would like to make a scatter plot and see what all this looks like. Let me ask you this. If I pull this up here, I just got a dumb question. You know, sometimes I do that. By looking at that table, 
Can you tell me what you think the association is or the direction? Like, look at the variable. Well, I mean, I'm going to give you the one. The NEA change looks like it's going from the smallest to the largest, right? What's happening with the fat gain? Is it going from larger to smaller? Not exact, but is it going from larger to smaller? In other words, what I'm asking you is, without me making the scatter plot for you, can you look at that and tell me that you're seeing a negative association? As the NEA change increases, what happens to the fat gain? It uh, decreases, right? Now, if I showed you the scatter plot, you'll immediately tell me you see from upper left to lower right. I just want to check to see, if I just give it to you like this, can you tell me? Yeah, it looks like as the NEA change increases, the fat gain, it's not exact, right? But overall, it looks like I'm seeing this negative association. How do we know for sure? Scatter plot. Remember, fat gain is your Y, NEA change is your X. Are we seeing a positive, a negative association? Are we seeing upper left and lower right? And the answer is, yeah. They're all just a minute. Right? So in other words, as a person's NEA change increases, what happens to the fat gain? It, it actually decreases. This is what I was showing you last week. Negative association means as I increase this way, I decrease that way. Right? So the people with a higher NEA change gain less fat. The people with the lower NEA change gain more fat. However you want me to say that to you, what I see here is yes? Now how do I know this for sure? What else should I calculate here? Well what I should calculate is I should slide this over just what we were talking about in the other chapter, I can go to Stat Basic Statistics Correlation, and I should calculate the correlation between the NEA change and their fat gain. What I want to know out of you folks is, does that match up with what I'm seeing in your scatter plot? Does the negative make sense? Yeah. So over here, my correlation that we calculated, right, was... Points, minus point seven seven nine or something like that. How strong is it? Oh no, it's fairly strong here. Right? I'd be talking about what? How would I take that number and look at my scatter plot, look at my correlation, and what kind of statement would you make for me here? Well, we're looking at a. I'm going to give it like this. I'm not going to call that you know crazy strong. I'm going to say we have a moderately strong. negative linear relationship. So I have everything in that little piece that I need, right? Here is your strength. There is your direction. There is your form. Anytime you see a scatter plot, you're supposed to give me this direction, form, and strength. I see it in the correlation. Negative, negative association. We're fairly close to minus one, so we're moderately strong. I also see it in your scatter plot. Are we okay with this? I want to have both of those looking at me at all the time when I'm going to talk to you about a linear relationship. I need a correlation. I want to look at the scatter plot too. Okay? So it turns out that there's a moderately strong negative linear relationship between what? A person's NEA change and their fat gain when you overfeed them, right? That's what we're seeing here. Now, I'm always interested, right underneath in your, in your problem here, it says, do people with larger increases in NEA tend to gain less fat? So that's the question that they really want to answer here. And then what I want to know out of you folks is, what's the answer to that? What are they asking you? They're asking you, the question is, do you see a negative association? 
That's the way I think about that question. That's exactly what that's asking. Do people with larger increases in NEA tend to gain less fat? In other words, do these things go opposite of each other? Or if you like, inverse of each other? People that have a high NEA change, do, is their fat gain lower than the ones that have a lower NEA change? You tell me. i got to draw one more thing on here. Back to last week. Out here are the ones that have a large NEA change. Well, they have a lower fat gain. Down here are the ones that have a lower NEA change, and they have a higher fat gain. The question is asking you, do you see a negative association? What's the answer to it? Do you? And the answer is... I'm sorry. I can't yell that. The, the explanation is done. Maybe it's like I do. Just do this. I've shown it to you two different ways. I can see it in the scatter plot. No, I can see it in the value of the correlation. Right? Scatter plot show me the reds match up, the blues match up, the correlation is minus 0.779. Can you see a negative association? Okay. So there's one more thing we gotta do. I gotta get rid of all these colors. And I would like to put on here a regression line. So I gotta get rid of this. And I'm gonna come right back here to scatter plot. This time I want to put the regression line on. I want to, I want the software, and the language I'm going to use on you here is very precise. We want to fit the line to the data. Please, you never fit the data to the line. That's not the way this is done. You fit the line to the data. You don't fit the data to the line. You're going, really, there's a difference? Yeah, there's a difference. All right? So I want with regression. Remember, I want the fat gain is my y. Now look, I'm, I'm making these here, but these are the same pictures that's in your, uh, in your book. These are the same scatter plots and everything. Now, the reason I blew that up is this. What do I want to use this for? What I would like to do is I would like to pick some NEA change, and I would like to make a prediction for the person's fat gain. Now, I'm not going to pick one that I already have. The ones I already have are the little blue dots here, right? So just for the sake of things, Let's just say that I think I'm going to have a person that has a positive NEA change of 300. In other words, right there. I want to know, what does that line predict their fat gain to be? And anybody that's anywhere that's like math, math inclined, you're not going to like me doing this because this is not the way a lot of people think about this. What you do is... find that point on the line. Then you read across. What have I got here? Am I somewhere between, let's say, two and two and a half? I'm going to say... So what my line is doing is it's predicting if I happen to have a person that has an NEA change of a plus 300, it predicts their fat gain to be 2.4 kilograms. Is there anything special about 300 here? Could I have picked any value down here? Yeah. In other words, could I have picked any value, and I'm going to do it like this, from here to, let's say, here? Could I have picked any value between them? And the answer is yes. There was nothing special about 300. Hell, I could have picked 250, 200, 125, 122.7. I could have picked anything I wanted, read up to the line, and read across, right? In other words, that is using this line that's drawn on your scatter plot to make a prediction for a value of your explanatory variable. Where is he pulling that out of? That's what was in the definition of regression line, right? Predict the value of y for a given value of x. I predicted the value of fat gain for a given value of NEA change, right? And I could have done it for any value between, let's say, minus 100 and 700 NEA change. Now, is that really the way we operate with lines? Not exactly, but that's what we can do then, right? So, look, I'm going to be honest with you. What we need is...
I don't like having to have the scatter plot with the line and then me pulling out a freaking roller and going up and going across. That's not the way it's supposed to work for us, right? I need a equation for the regression line. See, because I can't let, of course, if we were all using Minicab, we'd all get the exact answer. Same, you know, you'd have the same thing drawn on there. If we were going by hand, we'd all draw a different line on there. We need an equation for the regression line. All right? Now, I don't know what we remember about straight lines. So I'm going to give you like a quick little thought here. Okay? And I will use, it hurts me to put the word straight in front of lines, but I will. Because your textbook does. Okay? Now, I apologize for the way I'm going to write this. If you remember anything from any algebra class you ever have, R's look like Y equals A plus BX. She's squinting and you're going, really? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's the way we write it in this class. Y is equal to A plus BX. Yes. I know if you remember anything any, out of any algebra class, that seems not good. Okay? And the thing is, is the B is your slope. You know, you think about slope as being the changes in the Y's over the changes in the X's. How about the rise over the run? However you want to think about the slope. And the A, here is your Y intercept. The Y intercept is when X is equal to Zero. Okay? Are we okay with this? So they always have this form for us. They're always going to look like a y equals a plus bx, where b is your slope and a is your y-intercept. That's the value when x is equal to zero. It's where it crosses the y-axis. Okay? Now, example 5.2, still using this NEA change and all that, What they're going to do is, is they're going to give me the equation for that line that I have drawn on there for you in red. Okay? And it says, any straight line describing the NEA data from example 5.1 will have this form. It will have fat gain. Oh yeah, see the variables mean something to us, right? You know, there's an explanatory response variable is equal to A plus sum B times the NEA, and I'm going to write change here. Folks, all they're saying is, this is your Y, and that's your X, right? So, in this class, you know, the variables have meaning. There's something attached to them. It's just not a Y and an X. So, what they get here, they get the equation being that gain is equal to 3.505 minus 0.00344 times the NEA chain. Okay? So again, this is your Y, there is my X. They're actually putting the names of the variables in there to get you started here. To remind you they mean something to us. Now, I want to see, can we pick out the slope and the intercept? I know. Can we pick out the slope and we, can we pick out the intercept? In other words, can we pick out the B and can we pick out the A? Now, let's start with the A. A is equal to 3.50. Everybody okay with that? Remember, that's the A, right? 3.505. What does that mean to us? I mean, look, it's just not 3.505. What does that mean? It's the estimated fat gain if 
the NEA chain. is zero. In other words, if you overfeed a person for eight weeks and their NEA chain does not change from what they were doing before, we would estimate that they would gain 3.505, and I'm actually going to put here in blue, that's 3.505 kilograms. In other words, they behave exactly the same before as they did when after you overfed them, you, we would we're expecting them, we would estimate them to gain 3.505 kilograms of fat, right? Remember, the intercept is when x is zero. It's when the value of your explanatory variable is zero, the NEA changes zero, that is your y, the estimated fat gain is 3.505 kilograms. Now, which number here is the slope, and does the sign go with it? The sign always go with it, right? The slope is always the number in front of the x variable. So my slope here, b, is minus 0 0.00344. Yes, I put my pen down, I backed up. I looked at you all for a second because here's the thing. I can always get everybody to, look, what I just did here in, with the A is I interpreted what the intercept was, right? In other words, you know, we're estimating the fat gain to be 3.505 kilograms if the NEA change is zero. That's no problem, right? So, okay, your explanatory variable is zero. Here's the estimated value of the response. Now, the slope, on the other hand, we want to interpret it. I know you guys have seen algebra before. You've talked, you've seen like the intercept and the slope before, and nobody ever interprets the slope for you. Uh, my variables have meaning here, all right? So the way we do this is this, and it always starts out exactly the same anytime I interpret the slope of a regression line. For each additional. So what I want to think about is, is increasing my explanatory variable by one. So for each additional calorie, because remember, any A change was in calories, so whatever spin you want to put on this, what I've just done is I have increased your explanatory variable by one unit. Right? For each additional calorie of NEA change, so if I change the NEA change by one calorie, what happens to the response variable? The fat gain, since your slope is negative, decreases by whatever the value of the slope is, kilograms, and I need this last little term here on the average. Because that's the way we're thinking about this. This is on the average. So one more time, for each additional calorie of any A change, the fat gain decreases by 0 0.00344 kilograms on the average. In other words, for each additional one unit of your explanatory variable, the response variable decreases by the slope, and then I'm going to put here, does everybody see that your slope is negative? And so you're decreasing here because the slope is negative. If the slope was positive, you would have increased by the value of the slope. Now, I gotta draw you a picture here if you don't mind. I, I try not to be overly mathematical with this here. You're going to do it. You ain't doing a very good job today. Yeah, I know. So here's the way I think about this. So there's some value of your explanatory variable, whatever it is. I want to add one to it. Right? So that, I'm adding one. Now, this should look familiar if you remember anything about the rise over the run. You see the length of that side of that? Yes, I'm going to use the term triangle on you. It's one, right? In other words, the 
run is one. We set it up for each additional one unit of your explanatory variable. And then the question is, what's the other side? It's actually the slope. Right? So we set the change in x to be 1. The change in y is actually the slope at that point. So what I'm saying is, over here, you went down. You decreased by 0. 0.00344. That's what I'm writing out. In terms of a picture, that's what I'm writing out here, right? Okay, so, yeah, yeah you've increased by 1 calorie of NEA change, what happened to the fat gain on average? Oh, it decreased by the slope, because you'll notice, when you went from X to one more than that, you went down the line, you've actually decreased there, what I have in red, you decreased by the value of the slope. Now, every time I show you a regression line, I'm going to try to remember to interpret the slope for you, whether the slope is positive or negative, and you'll see me do the same thing every time. Alright? Now, I want to get the line that me and you are going to use that has a name, right? This is not any old line. Me and you are going to work with what's called the least squared regression line. That's the one we use in this class. That's the one we fit to the data. That's the one I have drawn on the scatter plot here. That one in red, that is the least squared regression line. Back here, that equation at the top, that the fat gain was 3.505 minus 0.00344 times any A chain, that is the least squared regression line. Anytime in this class that somebody shows you a regression line on a scatter plot or gives you the equation of it, it's the, it is the least squared regression line. Now, what makes it so special? Let's see. I'm trying to put it in English that's not math English. It makes the vertical distances. from the line to the points as small as possible. Now, I'm going to do this. When I talk about these vertical distances, these are really errors, right, that the line is making when we're trying to fit the line to the data. And so, what the hell does that mean? You see all these guys here? That's a vertical distance. That's a vertical distance, right? Those are errors, right? Any point that doesn't lie exactly on the line or any point that the line doesn't pass exactly through gives us one of these vertical distances, right? It gives me an error in my prediction. See, because you give me any one of those little blue dots there, the line's not going to predict exactly what the data gave me. You understand that, right? They're going to be different. So what does the least squares regression line do? It takes all those vertical distances, and I'm going to move my hands like this, and I apologize. So I'm sitting here, right, and I'm trying to fit the line to the data. And so what I'm really thinking about doing is adding all those vertical distances together. And then I'm going to move it until when I add them all together, I get the smallest possible value. So the folks that take tackers, what I'm doing is I'm minimizing all those vertical distances all at the same time. All right? Now, I just want you to know what it's doing. Nobody's going to make you do that. So I may have to give and take a little bit to say, you know, if I move it a little bit here, oh, that makes the sum of all those vertical distances as small as possible. That's what I'm looking at. Taking all those blue lines and making their length when I add them together as small as possible. Right? In other words, that's the least square regress line. That is the best fitting line, the way we think about it. Now, I'm going to come over here, and I'm on page 131. I'm going to give you this little 
I'm not, I'm not going to write this down. I'm going to say it to you. And it says this. Sometimes I get a little nuts and I like to read stuff out loud like this. It says the least squares regression line of y on x. I am going to write that. Remember, it's y versus x. It's y on x. It's your response when you're explanatory. Your response versus your explanatory. Is the line that makes the sum of the squares of the vertical distance of the data points from the line as small as possible. That's what I'm drawing over here. Is anybody ever going to ask you that again? No. Am I ever going to read that to you again? No. The line me and you always use is the least square regression line. Right? It's the best fitting line for the data. Okay? Now, the reason we like it, I got a couple of reasons. One is it's the best fitting line. The other one is it's what Minicab uses. And the other one is the equation looks like this. Now, forgive me, I need to do something with your y. Because I don't want to confuse what's coming, the y's that are coming from my line with the y's that are coming from the data. So we put a little hat, and that's actually read as... So you know that value is coming from your line, not from the data. And it still looks like what we had talked about before, A plus Bx, right? Now, remember, the slope is going to be, the slope is B, and how is it calculated? Well, it's R times the standard deviations in the Y's or the standard deviations of X's. So if we knew the correlation and we knew the standard deviation of the y variable or the standard deviation of the x, that's how you would calculate the slope. And the intercept, the y-intercept, a, is calculated as follows. It's the mean of the y's minus b times the mean of the x's. You guys are writing it down. I would never give you all the information to make you produce this. I want you to know what the, how am I pulling this out? Okay. Now notice what it all involves. It involves mean of that, standard deviation, mean of the y's, standard deviation. Folks, these are all things me and you have discussed. Mean, standard deviation, and the correlation in the previous chapter. That's all it's there. All right. Now, here's what I would like to do. Before I go on and we start talking about, okay, these facts or this facts or this thing, how did I come up with that? How did they come up with that in this problem about any HN? How did they know that that was the line? So here's what I do. I've shown you how to make a scatter plot. I've shown you how to put the line on there. So now the question is, is, can we actually get the equation of the line out of here? And I always do it the exact same way. I want to go to stats. And I want to go to regression because that's what me and you were talking about, right? The regression line. And I want to go, and the only place I ever go here is fitted line plot. Why? Because that's exactly the way I explained this to you, is I want to fit that line to the data, right? The best fitting line. So I went stat, regression, Fitted line plot. Okay? Don't be shocked. Another one opens up and it wants to know, okay, what's the Y variable? What's the X? Notice it tells us the response is Y. And remember, the response is fat gain. But then it does something else that seems odd to me. Won't let me write. You see where it says predictor X? Many have knows exactly why you want the equation this line. It knows you want the explanatory variable, the one that's going to be used to make the prediction. It knows you want the line to make a prediction. So it even like reinforces that with you that, oh yeah, what's your explanatory? What's the predictable predictor? What's your x? What variable are you using to make the prediction? It's any a change, right? Click it. So, I really like this picture, because this gives me everything me and you have talked about other than not giving me the correlation. It's given me the scatter plot. It's given me the regression line.
And right there sits your equation. Fat gain is equal to 3.505 minus 0.003441 any A change. That's where I always get this. I get the scatter plot, I get the regression line drawn on it, and I get the equation for my least squared regression line. Are we okay with that? So what I would like to do is this. Earlier, I had shown you that if you give me that regression line, and I'm going to write it like this, fat gain, and I'm going to put a little hat on that guy, I want to make sure you know that this is coming from your line. It was 3.505 minus, I understand back here there's like a little one, right? There's 0 0.003441. And then I'm not going to write that little X as multiplication. I'm going to assume you understand that this is your NEA change and we're waiting for somebody to give me a value of NEA change. Are we okay, right? So all I did was copy that line down. I wrote a little hat on the fat gain so you know it's coming from the line. So here's how we use this, okay? What is the estimated or predicted fat gain for and any A change of three hundred calories. So let me ask you, what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to predict the fat gain for when we're looking at any A chain of three. Any A change of 300 calories. What did I give you? Well, can I be the math guy here and say, I want you to find Y hat when... How's that? That's like the math guy in me coming out. So what do I want you to do? I want you to plug 300 in for any A change, and I want you to tell me what the predicted fat gain is. All I'm asking you to do is pull your calculator out, take this least squared regression line, and plug in 300. All right? That's what I'm asking you to do. However you want to read that question, I'm asking you, okay, what's the predicted fat gain for any A change of 300 calories? I want any A change, your X to be 300, and I want you to find what and why. Anybody got a calculator going to tell me the answer to this? Johnson City, anybody got a calculator? Tell me the answer to this, please. I mean, I can go back and eyeball it, but I already did that shit with the 300. Remember, I eyeballed 2.4. I was just wondering how good my eyeball was. This right here will be no eyeball, and this right here will be exact, right? Because I'm plugging into the equation. It's not like I'm reading up and reading over. What'd you get? Huh? No. I don't know. Okay. Well, we'll wait. Well, I have to wait because I, I can't go on. I'm hoping it's two point close to two point four seven. So she's telling me two point four seven, and then we'll just go to there, right? So that's not eyeballing. That's exact, right? I plugged into the equation, and what it's telling me is this. Just so you understand, it's telling me that if I'm looking at here at three hundred. Then when I looked over here to see what that value was, remember before I eyeballed it, and I had no idea that it was that close. We didn't eyeball, we plugged in, we got the exact answer, right? So we never eyeball. If somebody gives me the equation line, tell you just plug in the value of your explanatory variable and tell me what the answer is, right? I mean, there shouldn't be nothing, there's nothing special here. It's just you plugged in 300. Be careful with your minus signs. That's all. Now, can I go back to the one about the manatees?
see if we can get the equation of that and all that kind of stuff, right? Just, just for the sake of doing that. Um, so I'm done with this one. That's about all I can do with it. Look, if somebody gives me the equation of the line, I interpret your slope, I interpret your y-intercept, I show you how to get a value out of it, there is nothing else. Okay? So, we get rid of that one. Um, I gotta go back to the previous chapter, right? So, I'm going to go back to chapter 4. Yeah, I know. I, I can do it. It's no problem because, uh, I mean, it's still just data. I wanted something. The reason I want to do this one is because I want something where I know I see a positive association. So if I go back to chapter 4 and I find the one about the manatees. Now, I'm going to do this all in one step here. I'm going to give you the line. I'm going to give you the scatter plot, and I'm going to give you the line on the scatter plot. Remember, that was stat, regression, fitted line plot. We always think about fitting the line to the data. What's my variables? Remember, we thought the number of votes registered would explain or influence the number of kills, so the response is the number of kills. The predictor or your explanatory variable is the number of votes. We okay with that, right? So notice, I'm only going to circle what I'm really interested in here is, there is the equation of your least squared regression line, that line that's in red, all right? And so I got to come over here, I'll have to go back and forth. What did I have? Kills. I'm going to put the little hat on it, Minicab doesn't do that for you, and I get, what is it? Minus 45.27. My slope is 0 0.1331, and that's the number of votes registered. In other words, again, here is your work. If you think is your Y, and there's your X. In this class, we always give you the labels of the variables in terms of the variable. Okay? Now, let me ask you this. What, which number here is the slope? Slope's actually positive this time, right? Right. Slope's 0 0.1331. What's the interpretation for each additional vote register? The number. of manatees kill does it increase or decrease? Increases by now why does it increase? Notice the slope is Positive, right? So it increases because we are looking at a positive slope. So for each additional boat registered, the number of manatees still increases by whatever the slope is. Now, what number is your y intercept? What number is your a here? Your a here, your intercept. is a minus 45.27. So here we've got to have a little discussion. Does it make any sense to even talk about the y-intercept? Does it make a sense to even talk about when there's zero votes registered? Can you have a negative number of manatees killed? No interpretation. It doesn't even make sense. Can I always interpret the slope? Yes. Sometimes I can interpret your 
intersect. It makes no sense to talk about anything here when the number of votes registered is zero. Then we're going to talk about the number of boats, the number of manatees killed by boats when there's no boats registered. You understand my problem here by the purpose, right? So it makes no sense. Now, I know it's time to go to the house. The other thing I want you to notice here is, is this. I haven't mentioned anything about this really yet, but you see this? These range from 400 to 1,100, right? Boats registered. Is zero even in that range of data? No boats registered, right? Zero's way over here. Yeah? You don't even have any data near zero. So with that said, in other words, it makes no sense to talk about zero boats registered. You don't have any data near zero boats registered. I'm going to leave green there. That's the reason we don't want to interpret it. Can I always interpret the slope? And the answer is yes. Now, when we come back on Thursday, can I make a prediction here? In other words, could I pick some number of boats registered, maybe like 825, and you tell me the number of many people we'd expect it? Yeah. Be careful going to the house. I will see you on Thursday. We'll pick up here somewhere.